Welcome, Taking It to the Nub, Season 1, Episode 21. Tonight we are going to have an amazing show. Um, I am waiting for uh, Glenn Loop, our guest. He is the Executive Director of the CRA, otherwise known as the Cigar Rights of America. He will be on shortly. Oh my God. <laughs> can, can you hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> God, a bloody miracle. I tell you what, you know, this is like, I always tell people, we start these things, um, uh, try, I try to get things going 15 minutes beforehand because I always end up with these little things that happen. I mean, And I look too dark, but I'm in a back room in our cigar club. Oh, uh, you're hiding, huh? Jeez. Uh, is that what they sent you now? That's it? This is your, your life now, the back room of a cigar club? Well, it's the quietest place in the cigar club. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Very good. You go all the way back to the beginning of the Cigar Rights of America. You were a founding member of it? Yes. Founding, founding director, let's put it that way. It was a CRA before there was a Glenn um, on board. Uh, in terms of the abbreviated history of it, the uh, industry, I think, announced, the manufacturers announced that, that it was going to be a CRA in, I think, July of 2008. Okay. Um, ironically, I was lobbying for the Cigar Association of Virginia and the, in 2006, 7, and 8. And in July of 8, um, we brought Rocky Patel to Virginia to wine and dine the, the House Republicans on a smoking ban bill. And after the, it was a weekend event uh, with the House Republican Caucus and Rocky asked if I would drive him to an event at my local cigar shop, which was about an hour away. And uh, he, on the drive, he said, we're starting this thing. Do you want to run it? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, not to belabor the whole story, but I initially said, no, why don't you hire me as a consultant to get it off the ground? And we wrangled and wrangled and wrangled, and it went through all the way to November. And between to, and in November is when I said yes. Uh, but between here, July and November, they launched their Freedom Tour, where they went to five cities to launch Cigar Rights of America. Uh, they went to... New York, Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, Milwaukee, and Orlando. And that was the beginning. And uh, so I, I said yes around Christmas, actually, just before the holidays of eight. So I kind of considered July, I mean, January 1 of, of 2009, the, the formal beginning. Uh, so that was, it was a long, you know, and that was, you know, 11 years, seven months, 12 hours and 18 minutes ago. Wow. Yes. Going on 12 years when you stepped down right after election day this year. That's right. That's right. Um, Did you pick that date? Uh, we talked about the date and it's kind of, let's push it. It's the date I wanted because I thought it was it's symbolic in a lot of ways. I mean, I've now gone through two terms of the Obama administration and the first term of, of a Trump administration. And I, I thought it was a lot of, uh, you know, symbolism, if you will, in terms of uh, drawing that, that chapter to an end. As I'm fond of saying with, with Jill being a couple of doors down, I've had marriages not last this long. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a background in like activism and lobbying or what is- Oh, absolutely. I, I you I, to get into this. I never knew anything else. Uh, I've never done or studied anything else. <laughs> Uh, but I've been a political, I had this discussion on that uh, uh, Light em Up broadcast, I believe is where I had, last time I had the discussion on Wednesday. Um, I mean, I was born into a very political family. Uh, my grandfather was a sheriff. My father was an elected official, politically engaged through my entire youth. Um, my first job out of college was working for our our legislature our house of delegates and I, I was a legislative assistant to a member of the house a member of the senate 15 different political campaigns um 2000 uh, even though my whole life was government in one form or another I, I worked for the university of virginia i worked for a local government worked for a college uh, um 
and in 2001 to 2008, I had my own lobbying advocacy government relations firm. And uh, the Cigar Association of Virginia was born during that, and we helped assemble that with the retailers in Virginia. 2006, first smoking ban was introduced in Virginia, and I thought to myself, how dare our legislature tell us we can't smoke in our local cigar bar? And that was the beginning of, of the advocacy with the cigar industry was the, cigar, the birth of the Cigar Association of Virginia. And, uh, you know, and that's when we got to know a lot of people in the industry and it's a, it's evolved from there. And, you know, I can say that the whole industry has evolved during that time, especially the premium side of the industry. Um, at the time, the, uh, the RTDA was headquartered in Georgia. Um, we started and launched the, the office for CRA in Washington. Uh, Mike Copperman came on board as our legislative director. And then, you know, within moments of that, metaphorically speaking, uh, the, the Tobacco Control Act passed Congress. And that was on the heels of S-CHIP passing in Congress. So it was kind of a perfect storm for the politics of premium handmade cigars. And the industry realized it had to do something very, very different. And they didn't know that it was going to be this expensive or this cumbersome or this threatening. But that's where the sophistication level of the, the ability of the, of the premium cigar industry to defend itself politically was born in some really very humble roots. I mean, you know, who would have thought when they were uh, launching CRA in the fall, you know, late summer, fall of, of 2008, that the number and level of threats with confronting the industry would have blossomed the way it did. And you know, it's been sticker shock. It's been the internal conflicts, which are no secret. Uh, you know, it's not only internal to the differences of opinion and, and the like within premium cigars, which is natural. It's, you know, it's all families fight. But, um, but you know, then you have the mass market element, you have the big tobacco element, and you have a coalition of 42 healthcare groups that would love nothing more than to put the entire industry out of business. So and speaking of cigar, premium cigars, uh, you know, as I watch the comments coming in, uh, Walsh wants to know, coalition of 42 are you smoking right now? I'm smoking a Pete Johnson TAA 2020. Nice. And I've got a Red Meat Lovers Club, Steve Soccer, original made for smoke in for their Red Meat Lovers Club dinner at the Great Smoke. By the way, as I'm completely color coordinated tonight. I like that. Now, is that a rich? Is Steve doesn't have any accounts near me, so I don't get to uh, partake of of Steve Saka cigars unless I'm in downtown Washington at, at Drapers. Um, so it looks like a pretty rich cigar. This is this is a hearty, definitely a hearty cigar. Fabulous after having a huge tomahawk steak dinner. Mm hmm some nice bold red wine and sit back and enjoy one of these. Absolutely. Well, I traditionally don't talk about a lot of what I'm smoking. You know, when you got 65 benefactors, they're all your favorite. But I, <laughs> so I, I figured when, you know, Pete only puts these out for the TAA and does so annually, I thought I was on safe ground. <laughs> there you go. That's, that's fair enough. How, how, how big is your TAA collection? Well, not necessarily a collection. Uh, I do have, I, I usually, because um, Shorty with Havana Connections in Richmond and, and John Drapers in Washington are the two closest TAA member stores that are uh, near me. So every year Shorty has a you know, big, uh, you know, Christmas and su the summer su uh, sale and stuff. So I've, I've got uh, some of uh, George Padron's TAA cigars in stock because you, you they were late coming out and you get, get them and you grab them while you can um love what crown heads puts out with with taa um uh, they're all you know unique in in whether size or or blend um but i, I got these from uh i can't remember who <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember who from from uh from 
Abe at Smoke Inn. I was about to say, you probably and didn't. I, and I did it so that I could try the Anarchies. Yeah, that's I it. it. I did it. <laughs> did you Did you smoke the Anarchy? I, I tell you what, talk about hearty, but I loved it. That's a good cigar. Absolutely. So, so you and I, I think the first time we really met, we probably passed each other in a few IPCPCRs when I was getting involved starting Stogie Press, but we got involved and let's just, uh, let, let, let's roll the clock back just a bit, right? We did this thing called Save the Leaf. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I, I wore this hat because of you tonight. I, I love it. Well, actually, Ryan. Whoops. Wait a minute. I got to get it. That's the wrong one. I've got it here with me though. Oh, okay. You don't have to say it. There's, there, there he is, the big man himself, right? So we, we did that. This was like the opening day, and then we decided we're going to, okay, we're going to have the Day of Reckoning, which we all marched on the Capitol. And I, I don't know about you. I wish there were a whole lot more people showed up. It just was kind of frightening that we couldn't even get some of the local D.C. members to show up for this. Well, you know, and – everybody's heart was in the right place uh -huh. and it was the right thing to do. But I tried, uh, I had this conversation and I, you know, it was just too late. The cat was out of the bag, if you will. Hold on. My wife is helping me. Look at this. I was thinking of you. Ah, oh, there you go. You got I was it. thinking, I actually brought it with me to the club tonight. <laughs> um, um, so the planning, you know, kind of came about. We weren't a part of the initial planning, uh, but, which was fine. And they asked for our support, which was great. And it was the right thing to do. And they, like I said, everybody's heart was in the right place. But Congress was out of session. And nobody yeah. wants to be in Washington in August. <laughs> because <laughs> there's, there's more than one reason that they say drain the swamp. Because it's built on a swamp. And it is August. It's like being in Miami in August. It's like, you know, the humidity levels through the, through the roof. But again, everybody was hearts in the right place. The, the, the agenda, the, the Friday night, you remember that we had the wonderful yeah. cookout. And I think we, we were at a hotel. I think it was right on the university of Maryland campus. Yes, it was. And, uh, we had a wonderful bonding experience, uh, there. And we, uh, we held a little vigil because Carlos Fuente had just passed away. Uh, right. I'm having a flashback and uh, well, I'm doing this. <laughs> uh, and it's a wonderful reason that you and I are, are having this discussion. But uh, the next morning, you know, we all start to gather at the Capitol. I couldn't believe they got the permit to hold it, hold it on the Capitol in front of the Capitol Rotunda oh, there. Like, and we were, not only did we get the permit to have it on the Capitol grounds, it was the first time they ever gave a permit to allow smoking on the Capitol grounds. And they came out, we all had the little tin buckets with the sand in it. And we were very nice. And nobody really made a, you know, nobody was slamming us along the way. Everybody was interested. If you remember all these people walking around, these tourists, they're like, what's going on? <laughs> Everybody was giving the right speeches. Uh, you know, that was a fun part. I had that discussion um, today. Yeah, this is that 40. And uh, we had great cigars available. There's Steve with Gurkha and Mr. Blanco. Um, and what was, uh, I, I, you know, the wonderful part about these Facebook memory thing popping up is it, one, it allows you to have a flashback. But uh, I do recall in, uh, when I reposted that, in the last 24 hours is that we did have people from 17 different states. Yes, we did. And now, and, and that, that was impressive. I mean, the fact that we did get, we were able to get a lot of people to come around from around the country. Um, I, I, we, we had the right sponsorship behind it. Um, and we, we did everything we could. Now, unfortunately, I mean, let's go back to the screen here. So unfortunately, um, that was four years ago and with lots of lawsuits along the way, yeah. PCPCR, CRA, others, other star advocates putting in brand owners, big guys, little guys getting involved. Right. We are. And 
I'm just going to speed the film up real quick and we'll get back to talking some fun stuff. Um, the FDA comes out the other day, big news of the week, right? Right. And says, yeah, maybe this is a little complicated. <laughs> uh, you know, well, yeah, there's an awful lot of these applications going to come in, and this is not our highest priority in this whole thing we're doing. So, yeah, we might do, so, a, a, allow you to ask for deferments. What's your opinion on that? I want to get your view on what yeah. that means, especially for people that have gone crazy and have took the due diligence, did all the paperwork, paid all legal fees, to get ready for September 9th, and all of a sudden it's like, mm, yeah, you know, just... Well, and the letter from the Justice Department on behalf of the FDA echoed a lot of the themes that we've been pounding for the last several years. I mean, for let's put it this way, and this will be, you know, this discussion with you is like a CNN news, breaking news moment, because I'll share with you what's happened on Friday. But, uh, and this is one of the first discussions I've had since all of this uh, broke out and the letter was issued, but going, you know, Senator Bill Nelson's no longer even in the United States Senate for Florida. It was during that early day in the introduction of our exemption legislation that I've got a copy of a letter that Bill Nelson wrote to the FDA asking them, one, if they were prepared, and then two, making the case that they were not prepared for the level of applications that would be submitted under, under the rules that they had proposed. And then the Cigar Association of America and PCA and CRA echoed that in comments filed in the last year based upon the fact that there's 51,000 SKUs in the premium cigar industry. Now the cigarette industry, a cigarette's a cigarette. It's all the same manufacturing process. It's, it's all the same chemical composition. It's all the same. You make a trillion of them literally and it's all the same. Every cigar is unique. Every one is made by hand. And as you well know, the, the blends, I mean, you may think you've got the same blend, but you don't know if it's all going to be, you know, perfectly in sync with continuity and consistency. And as we're fond of putting it, the only thing that this, this product has in it is tobacco, water, and sunshine. The only thing that changes it is age. And blending the different varieties and this tobacco might be aged two years longer than this tobacco and this tobacco might be grown in a field or a country and make it different and then what else happens every size may make it a little different and so much of this revolves around the agency's addiction their own addiction to the subject of, <laughs> i hadn't thought of it in that context their own addiction to the term nicotine their own addiction to the whole concept of nicotine so they want to make the case, well, if you smoke a cigar that's 48 ring gauge versus a cigar that's a 56 ring gauge, you're going to get a different level of nicotine. Well, if you're not inhaling, we've already made the scientific case. We do not contribute to the issues of addiction, inhalation, and mortality. And we've got the statistics to prove it. And in July, on July 25th of 2018, we filed an additional 529 pages with the FDA with studies from the Centers for Disease Control, studies from the American Medical Association, studies from the Centers for Disease Control in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that, that clearly denote that we don't have an adverse public health impact. And they refuse to accept it. And that was the other part of this letter that was very disheartening, if you will, is, oh, let's launch yet another premium cigar research project. Yeah, right? Research Scary. project. Scary. Well, between the CAA and PCA and CRA, we have submitted thousands, and I do mean thousands of pages of study and analysis. And what this all goes to prove is they don't like the statistics. Their own studies and studies from, you know, when you've got the New England Journal of Medicine and the AMA and the CDC echoing our data and the data that's out there are very independent of any source from the premium cigar sector. And you say, I want to launch a new research project. It just means you don't like the data you've already got. 
and it's 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 insulting it's pathetic it's ridiculous uh and and that's one of the reasons that honestly uh and this is the breaking news part sort of but you know friday evening we filed additional legal papers uh through our council that we can talk about first of next week um just basically saying that this is how another case study and how ill-treated this industry has been by the by the agency we've done our part we've submitted the research independent of anything we could have ever paid any consultant the 529 pages filed uh in 18 went into patterns of usage where we clearly documented the lack of addiction associated with premium handmade cigars uh you know first cigarette at 16 first cigar at 27 our demographic is 30 to 65 uh the the patterns of usage 65 Le know, less than 30 I, I only have years <laughs> <left>. <laughs> um you know the average cigar smoker having a, a basically is less than two cigars a month right you know it's 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 done in celebratory fashion it's done on friday night after a long week of work and you have one that's the normal American, you know, cigar smoker, but they just don't like the data. So let's throw up yet another research project, another delaying tactic. Let's go get a research and, project and that aligns and, with my thought. And while we're pleased with the whole concept of, of deferment, there's some unanswered questions with that. But what we're hoping for is some more sustainable, predictable, stable regulatory relief from the Trump administration before election day. And uh, that's what we're working diligently for. Now, now, have you gotten any, I mean, since that letter came out, um, have you got any more clarity as to a date when they want to say you got to send those letters in if you want the firm? Well, that's the reason that we've asked the uh, D.C. Circuit Court for a very quick turnaround in their opinion on, on this question, because that looming September 9th deadline, and this is not new, this has happened during almost every deadline that the FDA has been, that is, the FDA has confronted the industry with. They've been an 11th hour decision to either allow for some type of delay uh, or deferment in the past through some type of an extension. But uh, it seems to always be within, you know, less than 30 days of when the actual deadline is there. And it's a combination of legal pressure and political pressure that brings about further delays. And delays are great because they end up saving the industry money, but a lot of companies have been jumping through the hoop preparing for, you know, substantial equivalence filings uh, for months and months and months now. And yet here we go again, being jerked around by the unelected bureaucracy. Now, if, you, if, you're, if you're a brand owner or manufacturer and you have submitted, with due diligence, you submitted your paperwork for the September 9th date and you did it already. Let's say it's in. Uh, does the FDA have to act on that paper? I would think that would be handled between the company and the agency. Um, I really don't know how to answer that. Do you need a deferment if you send that paperwork, if you sent in a September well, paperwork? Well, you know, the, the, the crapshoot is that they never issued guidance on what they actually wanted. <laughs> so what what was being submitted by some companies was almost speculation based upon what you know you thought the agency may want and there are some concerns with that but and i understand why companies would, would do that but it was it was a roll of the dice as to what you submitted because the agency never issued guidance as to what they truly expected and that has been pointed out to the courts on numerous occasions now when you what is your definition when you read the rules, the current rules, and I've heard varying opinions on this, I'd like to get your view on it. Mm -hmm. The difference between substantial equivalence, predicate, and grandfather. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, grandfather would be anything before 2007. So that's there. All you got to do is say it was there, prove it was there. And then, and then there's the process of, then there's the process of companies uh documenting that a cigar that they've put out sub since 2007 is quote unquote substantially equivalent to something that was on the market before 2007 okay. and then you had the august 8th deadline of 17 <laughs> just starting to run together 
where you had to basically have product on the market, which that's another unique part of this letter. There is a, a hint in this letter that uh, it could be far, far easier for new companies to, to file with new blends under whatever deferment rule they come up with. So there could be some nuances there that could be very beneficial to the industry. At least it shows, at least it demonstrates that the agency is thinking finally about the nuances of this industry. And that, you know, it's like I said, what you're smoking is what came out of the ground. There's no chemical manipulation. There's no nicotine manipulation. So why are we forcing companies to go, out, go to all this trouble? Now, now going back to the other question, what 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 is predicate defined as? <clears throat> Pre two thousand seven. Pre two thousand seven predicate. Now, I've heard some people say it's predicate tobacco, <clears throat> as opposed to a pre predicate line or brand mark. Um, and I'm I, not sure I would go that far, but that's a nuance that you know greater minds than mine would have to figure out. But I think. I think it would have to be predicate blend, not just a blend that maybe was on the market is not on the market anymore. And I would want to be quoted on and that. I buy it. Talking, but. I'm a brand owner. I, I go talk to a manufacturer and he says, Hey, you know what? XYZ company had this on the market in 2004. They're out of business. You want it? And I put my brand mark on it and that's predicate. Predicate blend. Predicate blend. Blend is different than tobacco it's, it's uh, you know, right. itself. Right. Because tobaccos, because if you get into the predicate, you get into that discussion of predicate tobacco, it's what hurts my head. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm willing to even engage in that discussion. I'm not enough of an authority on that one to <laughs> dive into that. Okay. Now, you, you, you travel all over the country on this mission. Right. Pre-COVID, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. See my COVID. This is my COVID. Yeah. I'm a hot mess, but it's okay. Um, if you were to think about all the different folks you talk to, both consumers, manufacturers, brand owners, and politicians that are talking cigars, what do you think, what, what is your view of the break? And I'm going to get political here very slightly. What is the break between Democrat versus Republican as far as percentage-wise? Oh, my goodness. That's, an, that's a one, you know, that I've done two dozen podcasts since the uh, pandemic started, and I have not been asked that question. So the, you're asking me to break down the political composition of the cigar community. <laughs> I mean, well, let, let's, let's, let's take it easy. Let, let, let's, let's talk about <laughs> politicians that you talk to. How many of the Democrats versus the Republicans are on board with this? Well, I've been fond of saying, we've got a very bipartisan mission and we've got a very bipartisan base of support, very bipartisan. You know, I, I've said this a dozen times, but I did an interview with the Wall Street Journal years ago during a, a Bill Paley smoke in Paley Park in New York. And the journal was there and I said to them, and this was when they were both in Congress at the time, but I said, we've got to have the only legislation uh, in the entire Congress that's got Charlie Rangel and Michelle Bachman on the same bill, which must mean, <laughs> which must mean we're right. Um, you know, we've got and had ultra left wing uh, members of the House and Senate on our bill, and we've had ultra conservative Tea Party types on our bill, and we've had those that are very, very moderate. We've proven that this is not a partisan issue. Uh, consistently, in the Florida delegation, Congressman Bill Posey and Congresswoman Kathy Castor, Posey the Republican, Castor the Democrat, have consistently partnered on our legislation. We've had great bipartisan uh, support uh, for our our call for regulatory relief from Bill Clinton's Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala, who's now a member of Congress, and ultra, ultra conservative members like ones that represent you know, me in Congress here in Virginia. So, uh, and likewise in the Senate, 
you know, I mentioned Senator Nelson. Well, Senator Nelson and Senator Rubio have consistently partnered, did consistently partner when Senator Nelson was in, in the Senate. And now Senator Rubio and Senator Scott partner up. But who do they partner with on the same bill? Sen Democrat Senator Bob Casey of Pennsylvania. I hope all what that demonstrates. Non, what about non-tobacco related states? If you would break the demographic down. So we talk about places like Virginia, Carolinas, Florida, Georgia. These oh, states. we've what got these non-tobacco uh, states. You find friendliness there? Or? Oh, depends on where they are, but uh, there's no tobacco grown in uh, Idaho and Montana, and yet we attract political support there. And Senator Tester from Montana, a Democrat, is is on our legislation. There's no tobacco growing out there. Uh, heck, we've had you know Democrats from Southern California sign onto our legislation. Uh, Jody Ernst from Iowa signed onto our legislation. Um, it's the ones that have no political excuse for not supporting us that are frustrating. Like Senator John Cornyn of Texas. You know, there's a lot of brand owners, manufacturers that are headquartered in Texas. An incredible retail base that spans one end of Texas to the other. Uh, we've had a lot of success with members of the House of Representatives from Texas, but, but Senator Cornyn and Cruz have, have not jumped on board, if you will. That's been a little frustrating. Um, I could think of a handful of others. Senator Tim Scott of, of South Carolina used to be on our bill, didn't sign back on. That's frustrating, and it's frustrated the retailers in that state. Um, but all in all, I, I could not find many bills like ours that don't have that have the level of bipartisan support that we do. Um, and I think that's that's a testament to how right the industry is on that. It's also a testament to the network. Uh, meaning we've had, you know, members of the House from Illinois that had one cigar shop in their district sign on because that one shop asked them to sign on. Uh, it's been a case study in getting our people engaged in the political process for the first time in their professional lives. As I told the retailers in, in Virginia in 2006, I said, you're no longer just tobacconist. Politics is now in your job description. Exactly. You need to you need to engage with the consumers, educate them. I mean, we try to do that all the time on these shows. Um, so, when you when you look at, at the, this whole landscape, let's say the best of the best happens for us, and the FDA wakes up one morning and realizes, you know, we probably should exempt these guys, right? Let's go. Well, with some form of regulatory relief. It does, yeah. So what, what do you think? So that's the point. What, what do you see as the biggest challenge going forward if we settle this issue in this industry? Well, that's a, that's a pretty wide open question. Uh, do I think we're going to get some form of regulatory relief? Absolutely. Personally, I, I think the agency's going down that path in one form or another. Um, I think we have a very respectable shot at regulatory relief from the administration. The problem is the permanency of that. Um, you know, November 3rd is a total unknown, just like November of 2016 was a total unknown. You know, I was on election every election, every election night, but Election night 2016, I was holding Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia's Electoral College prediction map, and he had every swing state going to Hillary Clinton. And, you know, boom, 4.15 in the morning, which I'm still staring at the television, I'm watching, you know, President-elect Donald Trump that nobody predicted. Right. And I, I've been fond of telling this story. I said millions upon millions of dollars were spent by both campaigns on polls that were all wrong calling the 16 election, but there was one poll that got it right. The readership poll for Cigar Fish Night of Magazine. That poll called it and said Trump was going to win. Now, I don't say that in a partisan context. I put it in the context that cigar consumers were pretty in tune with the electorate in 16. Uh, so uh, that poll wasn't done in, for this election. I, I wish it had been by somebody, but uh, there's so many unknowns out there. 
But the moral of that story, though, is this. Because we don't know what's going to happen, we need to lock in some form of regulatory relief now before the end of this administration. And this administration is, and again, I don't say it in a partisan context. I say this because it's a political fact. It's the most anti-regulatory administration since Ronald Reagan. Right, exactly. Well, if we don't know what's going to happen on November the 3rd, if everything, House, Senate, the White House takes a hard turn to the left, some of the worst possible tobacco legislation that's in the Senate right now could very well become a reality. And the industry has to be prepared for that, has to be prepared for the fight for that in the political event that that actually happens. Now, we don't know. But the game of politics is that you have to be prepared for any contingency. And this is the predict you have that to part predict and have have mitigation factors in place. <clears throat> well, in that part, this is the new normal. And you know, the, the cigar industry probably never expected that it would be permanently engaged in a political fight, whether in the courts or in the halls of Congress. But that's the reality now that the product has been deemed subject to regulation by the Tobacco Control Act. And we're going to have to, as an industry, have to do that soul searching to say this is the permanent campaign. It's not just regulatory relief in the next six weeks. It's the permanent campaign to be prepared for anything that comes back at you, whether taxation or regulation. Well, I would think so. I, I, I would think one, um, taxation is a, a challenge going forward. We, we've seen those challenges. You, you <laughs> Ray, especially you guys went head to head with New York years ago. You got them to lower their tax. They made more revenue and all of a sudden they raised their tax. That's right. They didn't learn from their lesson. Like you're not going to get more revenue by doing that. The fight is back in Albany all over again. And then, and then you have the other issue of, of states, individual uh. <laughs> states, and what they wish to do. Like Massachusetts. No flavored cigars, no acids, no, no, you cannot buy a, a Drew Estate acid in Massachusetts now. They're outlawed. Well, and the flavor issue, this is going to, there's going to be more discussion about this uh, early in the coming week. But this bill in California isn't more indicative of what can happen. It's a huge threat to the industry. Is these flavor bans being written so broadly that flavored descriptors can characterize you as flavored product when it's really I, all natural tobacco. And we all, you know, read the proverbial cigar reviews that are out there through online and print media. And, you know, when you say caramely and nutty, well, that doesn't mean there's caramel and nuts in it. It means that's the flavor profile you pick up on. As I'm fond of saying, just because you drink a Marlowe and you say you, I, I get hints of raisin doesn't mean there's raisins in it. That's correct. And that, that is an entirely new phenomenon by the tobacco control sector to try to attack all things tobacco. But that California bill and, the, and it, it going national in some form, and I can see you know, a dozen states picking up on that, oh, let's do what California did. That's the importance of a premium exemption in California on that type of a bill to send a message that we are truly different. And Vermont pulled that trick too. They were playing that for a while saying, you know, they That's were- right these reviews and saying, well, geez, see, they're all flavored. And when I saw that, I, I think I posted something. I go, you know what? I'm going to start writing my reviews and say, smells like tobacco, tastes like tobacco, <laughs> tastes like smoky tobacco, it's tobacco. That's right. It's the whole cigar tastes like tobacco. And that's the review becomes, it's just tobacco, right? If you want to know how it burns, yeah, you can see the burn, but it's all tobacco. And just, it's, it's craziness. What's notes of white pepper? That's one that's always gotten me. <laughs> white pepper. You ever have white pepper? Yeah, oh, God. I, yeah. White pepper hits you in the throat. Exactly. But, the, but it's those types of nuances that just prove the creativity of tobacco control people. I, you know, Captain Crunch. <laughs> you know. Let's not say that one. Tops, tops, baseball, bubble gum. <laughs> yeah, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> Nobody doing cigar reviews mentioned bubble gum. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so Glenn Loop is an individual. You started smoking cigars at the age of eighteen. No, it was it was later than that. Um, I was in my late twenties. 
late twenties. And, uh, and you know, when college friends were getting back together a few years after we had graduated, uh, at a great New Year's Eve party, I remember really having my, my first cigar, um, my f first, you know, golly, man, I'm having trouble remembering when my very, very first one was, but let's just say it's been 20 plus years. <laughs> <laughs> 20 plus, man, it's been. But <laughs> again, it, it more so goes back to that moment when, in two, and I was smoking well before 2006, but it goes back to that moment, the passion moment came when there was a legislative threat and I, we had this, we have literally two blocks from where I am tonight, this beautiful locally owned steakhouse that welcomed cigar smokers in its bar. And it was one of those beautiful old, is one of those beautiful old school types of bars where, you know, Sinatra and Dean Martin are playing in the background and dark mahogany wood and, uh, you know, candlelight to illuminate the place. And you go, this is the kind of place you should smoke a cigar. And, and, the, and it was physically abutted to our local cigar shop. And when that steakhouse opened, I literally walked in and I said, this is the kind of place to smoke a cigar. And that was like 90, 98, 99. And uh, I walked into the cigar shop and I go, I've got to get a cigar to go back into that bar. I cannot go back into that bar without a cigar <laughs> in my hand. And, uh, and I went back in there and I picked out a, a La Gloria Cubana. Uh, cigar and I took it back in there and it was no looking back and I, I just said the government cannot stop me from doing this that was the moment that it all came to me that the po politics of this industry struck me at that moment how dare a member of our state senate say that I can't do this um, and luckily even after a compromise was struck in 2008-9 um, it all still allowed you know places to have smoking as long as it was physically separated from the dining areas so they struck a compromise on that so you can still smoke in in virginia bars if you're not a physically you yeah. know it's like going into where the, the food standalone is. bars you can smoke we, yeah we can't do that you've got to have food but if you have smoking it has to be totally physically separated from the dining area yeah so that, got rid of that. that was a perceived compromise but again that goes back to the types of of smoking ban battles across the country uh, I had a meeting with PCA a couple of weeks ago on this subject. And right now, I mean, here it is, you know, August. Um, and we can already count up 17 states with, with cigar related issues going into the January state legislative season. Whether it be smoking bans, a statewide smoking ban that's very draconian, that's been tried before in Oklahoma, uh, will be back, no doubt and the, the press for exemptions will have to be on the table again. And the retailers in that state have done a, a fantastic job of heading to the Capitol and making the case for their exemptions for cigar shops, cigar bars and the like. Uh, but the question becomes, why should they have to go through that in a, you know, what is really a, essentially a very conservative state? Uh, they shouldn't have to have that battle, but yet they are because a member of the legislature who's in the leadership is, is pressing for that. Uh, you never know where these where these flavor ban proposals are going to go in terms of the broadness, like I mentioned in California. And then there's going to be dozens of tax issues. And uh, as Rocky was fond of saying on several broadcasts, because of all the COVID related uh, economic catastrophes that have confronted this country, there's going to be serious bills to be paid and starting in 2001. And so you you're we're going to have to keep a diligent eye out on tax increase measures literally from one end of the country to the other. Right. Now, when you, um, when you think about the flavored bands, right, um, what is your view on how the regulation sits on grandfathered brands? Like, so like a lot of these acid cigars, for instance, Jewish state, they've all been, you know, back in the day, 19, you know, 1990s, yeah. early 2000s. So are they, grandfathered or they fall in the other category of flavored no can't have i still think the agency is so focused on attacking flavored products that i don't think anybody's out of the woods mm. i mean if they can ban flavored cigarettes if they can ban uh and they've made absolutely no secret of their desire as an agency to ban flavored cigars they've made no secret about it and the companies that are involved in in that sector 
have consistently had fights on their hands. And so I, I don't think, I don't think the term grandfathered puts flavored cigars out of the woods. I think they're, they're, they're going to have a consistent political target on their back. I, I mean, personally, I don't think anybody ought to be regulated, but there's no doubt that flavored products are consistently having a, a political target on their back. And, uh, and they would love to broaden it as broad as it can possibly be. But that just goes to the heart of the political agenda by the agency. Right. And, and, and as we go forward, there's, there's going to be, you know, different innovations in the industry. We talk about steakhouses, for instance, you know, I, I remember back in the day in Minnesota, um, I was on a business trip hanging out in Manny's Steakhouse in Minneapolis and mm -hmm. smoking cigars after a big steak dinner, like you said, but now you can't do these. So you get a, then you get a, a shop like, um, like tailored smoke Preston Gray shop and, um, in, 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 in Carolinas, he, that guy's got it. He says a beautiful thing. He set up, he's got, he's, That's right. he's got a That's steakhouse, a high end steakhouse, just down a few doors down. You can order a full steak dinner off the menu. Hey, I don't mean to interrupt you, but could I step out for just a second and take care of something? Yeah. Entertain your, your, your viewers for just a second. Yeah, so what I'll do is I'm gonna dro I'll drop in a little bit of the news and reviews on Stogie Press and we'll come back. I'll be right back. Okay, no problem. So yeah, so let's go take a run to that. So um, we go into Stogie Press last week. A lot of things have been happening this past week. So let's drop into Stogie Press. So Looking at some of the news that came out, uh, so I started the week off with, I put out an article, I have uh, second in the series of articles I've been doing on uh, what I consider my must try Honduran cigars this time. Um, the Honduran cigars, uh, I've made a nice list here, I've got some good comments on it. Um, and they're in no particular order, but you can check them out. Uh, a lot of people have smoked these and they don't disagree. If you've got ones that you think could be on the list, just add them in the comments and, and let, let, let everybody know what you think about Honduran cigars and what, uh, what you think they should try. Uh, Gurker uh, announced that they're re-releasing the San Miguel. Uh, this is a uh, grandfathered cigar that they're coming out with. It's uh, made with, uh, Ag with Aganorsa leaf. So it's a Nicaraguan Puro. So that's, uh, that's hitting the shelves now. Um, Espinosa Premium Cigars, Eric Espinosa announced that they're canceling the 2020 Lizona Palooza because of the pandemic. So uh, right now that's not happening. They're looking at a, a future date. Um, so Eric wrote a whole letter to, uh, to the industry on what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, I applaud him for doing this because you just can't have a group of people coming in, especially in a, in a hot spot like Miami right now. So. I applaud Eric for, for caring about all his, all his patrons that come in from all around the country. Um, the other part of the big news this week was um, we bid farewell to Nat Sherman. So uh, for many of you, you know, Nat Sherman has been around for 90 years. Um, Nat Sherman uh, had their flagship store in New York City. Um, they've had a number of stores, but this is the latest one that they've had. Um, this has been, this is a heartfelt thing with a lot of people in the cigar industry. This brand has been around since 19, 1930s. They've, uh, the, the, the fun part of this, he actually, Nat Sherman, if you didn't know this, okay, Nat Sherman actually ran a speakeasy in New York during the 1920s. And that's kind of where he, uh, he made his money. And then he had a, there was a, a patron that had a gambling debt to him, they settled for a half of the Opoka uh, cigar brand. And that's how he actually got into the cigar business and grew it ever since. So, uh, yeah, so Nat Sherman, he was also quite the innovator. He actually uh, innovated the plastic tip on the cigar. So back in the days, when I was younger, they, and I'm not talking like the Swisher Sweets, things like that, with the, these, these uh, tipperillos. I'm actually talking about the real, there was a plastic tip on a cigar. 
we have a big ring gauge and it was a plastic tip on it and he innovated that so that was pretty cool information about uh, who Nat Sherman was um, he also uh, kind of pioneered the uh, uh, the small tiny cigars the cigar the cigarellos um, and of course it wasn't without controversy as we all know um, when Altria uh, bought them out um, they made headlines back in 2018 when they kind of sided with the FDA saying there should be no exemption for premium cigars. There's been a lot of talk on that in the news. If you watched the, uh, the show this morning uh, um, with, with uh, uh, Smoke In, uh, the KMA radio show, um, they had Michael Herkulis on. And he was really good. He really explained this whole process of what happened. And, I have, you know, I give them credit. They, they, they really made, it, made a case for what that was all about. So whether you agree or not, that those, those are the facts of where things were. So unfortunately, uh, we bid farewell in that Sherman. It was no longer a brand on the market. Um, they're closing the store in New York City also as part of that. They are retaining, Altria is retaining the cigarette side, which was a separate division when they uh, bought out the company. So they're continuing with the Nat Sherman cigarettes. Um, CAO announced uh, a, a new cigar called The Bones, and um, what's fun about this, if you haven't been to the CAO site, I recommend, if you like Domino's, go to the CAO site, go to The Bones page, and there is a Domino's game that you can play. You can play, you know, it's Rick, you're basically saying you're playing against Ricky Rodriguez. So you throw the bones and you can play Domino's. I'm addicted to this at this point. I, I play this every night now. I just sit back and play my Domino's. And it's just this virtual game. And it's a lot of fun if you like Domino's or if you want to learn a little bit about Domino's. It's a nice place to go. I'm looking forward to trying the cigar. But meanwhile, I'm still playing the, uh, the bones game. Uh, Ace Prime and Crown Heads. So as you've seen over the last few weeks, Ace Prime and Crown Heads have joined together um, in, in, in a collaborative manner going forward. Crown Heads is doing all the distribution now for all the Ace Prime cigars, Ace Prime being what's coming out of the Pachado factory. Um, so they just announced the latest uh, release is the Pachado Maduro. So that should be hitting the shelves shortly. Um, Again, Ace Prime and Crown Heads announced the Dreamer. So there's another cigar that they just came out with. If you remember, um, Luciano Morales, he had a cigar last year that was called the Traveler. And this is the follow-up to that. It's called the Dreamer. Okay. And Fratello has announced they have an international-only cigar called the Sorella. This is one of the cigars that was in a test format amongst uh, consumers. They picked the blend, and that blend they're selling only over in the international market. Um, we already talked about the FDA. Um, they just, they've acknowledged they have a huge workload, and you can see these, this news is all over the cigar media. Um, and then lastly, uh, I pushed out this, uh, this morning, I pushed out the uh, episode 19 of taking it to the nub, the one we did with Robert Holt. Um, if you remember on that show, we had some technical difficulties at the end. Robert was in an undisclosed location and was having some internet problems. So I had some, I had to clean it all up. And when I pushed it out, post produced it. Um, some of the, uh, the, the reviews that we came out with this week, we've got, um, man, I just slowed down. So last night I pushed out the, the Black Works uh, Studio Green Hornet review. Now this is a cigar that's been around for quite a while. I, I've actually finally reviewed this cigar. And what's fun about this is actually I went in and I just, I remembered that I have my original comic book, not comic book, my original coloring book from back in the 1960s. And uh, <laughs> I used that as my photo op throughout all of the, the pitches I took at a cigar. <laughs> so, pretty cool. I realized I never did finish doing all the coloring. I'm, I must have got taken away with some baseball games or something. Um, we also reviewed 
uh, the Rojas KSG Lancero, phenomenal cigar, um, e excellent work. Uh, Noel Rojas uh, does a great job in what he does. He also did the DBL Mafu Maduro. So I did the Mafu um, uh, 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 which one was it? Uh, I'll go into here. The Cameroon. So I reviewed the Cameroon uh, about a year and a half ago. This cigar has been around my humano for about a year and a half. So I, I finally got around to reviewing this one. This is a big cigar. It's an eight by 60. So it's one of those cigars where you go in your humano and say, what do I want to smoke or what do I want to review? You need three hours to sit back and just, you know, think about it. So it, it kept like saying, no, yeah, I don't want, I don't want you to smoke me yet. And we also did the Rojas statement, uh, Corona and rated that one 94. So these Rojas cigars I'm really liking. Um, we did the, uh, uh, the post uh, uh, raffle this morning um, on Rojas and there were a few giveaways. Uh, there is a, somebody's getting a box of statements sent to them. So that was a uh, nice big prize this, this week on um, taking it to the nub in the raffle. But we'll come back to Dylan. Thank you. <clears throat> the other thing I should, I should note, um, we, I, I, wanted to get, I want to give a shout out to um, one other shout out I want to do on this show because it's important. Um, so we have a new sponsor. Um, I mentioned this this morning on the raffle show, but Tobacco Trading Company has uh, stepped up to sponsor Stogie Press. So I want to I want to thank them for all that they do. And if you don't know about Back Trading Company, Patrick Potter is the owner, a cigar maker. If you never met Patrick Potter, you can go back and look at the show we did a few months ago. We had him on the show. Um, great craft, um, just a, a big gringo that knows how to roll cigars, believe it or not. He's learned from the masters. So, uh, so I'm very, very happy that uh, they've come on board and supported Stogie Press. We'll come back to Glenn. So are we gonna, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, well, I do want to answer the uh, question. Mo, I hope, is that Mo? That wrote in about outreach to both presidential campaigns and I want to answer that and, and yes we do and yes we are. And it's in the context that, you know, the, the, as I'm fond of calling it, the, ac the, economic, the economic axis of the cigar industry is Florida and Pennsylvania. And there's a rumor that they're important to the election. Strictly a rumor, but rumor has it that whoever's, you know, going to win on November 3rd, Pennsylvania and Florida are going to be critical to that uh, outcome. We are making the political case that if you want the support of the cigar industry for Pete's sake, uh, pay attention to our issue. And we are conveying that message to, to both campaigns. And I'll never forget, uh, during Big Smoke uh, Vegas last November, uh, a, a gentleman came up to me in our, our CRA booth and he said, can, can we you know, have a little cigar over here and I'm gonna talk to you. And I said, sure. He goes, I'm a little different. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I'm, I'm a liberal Democrat. I'm not like most people in this room. <laughs> I said, well, that's okay. And he says, well, and I, I run into Joe Biden. I'm from Delaware and I want to help our cause because I'm passionate for premium handmade cigars and I'm a liberal Democrat. And I said, that's okay. And that's terrific. We need, you know, messengers on both sides of the aisle. And I did the same bipartisan discussion I had with you. And I said, anything you can do or say to, to the, Biden camp, we would appreciate it. And we've got those all over the country. I mean, now, has, he, has he had, so I, I've been reaching out to Joe Biden, okay? Um, I got no response, all right? Um, has he made contact with the Biden campaign on this topic, do you know? Well, we, we've had outreach to it. Our Democratic consultants have had outreach and are conveying our message. Now, there hasn't been anything tangible feedback but, but we are conveying the message and we're definitively conveying the message to the Trump campaign as well. So uh, we send the message to both sides of the aisle. It's important that everybody in the political community be acclimated 
to what premium handmade cigar regulation means, not just to Pennsylvania and Florida, but the entire supply chain. I mean, right. the, the physical infrastructure, the supplier, the supplier, the distribution, the logistics network that spans from Florida to over 2,000 retailers across the country. Um, I, I saw somebody wrote in about men, even mentioning Illinois. Uh, we've had consistent support from especially downstate uh, Republicans in the House. Uh, Representative LaHood from Illinois comes to mind. That's a supporter of ours. And, uh, you know, back when he was in Congress, Jesse Jackson Jr. was a, was a, was a supporter. Um, but it's a, I know it's a weird political state, just like California is a strange state, and that came up. And what happens in California can go national. I want to bring that up because someone asked about, you know, what impact California can have. And California is an incubator for tobacco control legislation. And it's the reason you have to consistently pay attention to what's going on out there because in, in the world of tobacco control and regulation, it doesn't take long for bad ideas to spread. Right. So uh, that's the reason you have to watch what happens in Washington State and Oregon. Uh, we were talking about the states earlier before you, you went into the news. And, uh, you know, there's big referendums that can impact the, the tax structure on cigars in Oregon and Colorado coming up. Um, there's no shortage of issues at the local, state, and federal level, and it's it's a testament to why the political machine always has to be on for this industry. And I, I had brought up numerous times over the last four months, at least, that um, you know when you think about the electoral college, like you said, you think about the states that are the very big swing states, a state like Florida, if you win, mm -hmm. the chance you win the election. And I always said, you know, if you look at, if you just take the, just take the two percent number of the population that smokes cigars, and I would say there's probably more of that here in the state of Florida because we have an an older population. Okay, take that two percent number. If all two percent of that number vote for the candidate that's going to help us, that two percent wins them Florida. Does yeah. that it Absolutely. swings the whole state of Florida. And that's the political right. message we're sending to both camps. Absolutely. And they need to know that. They need to be out there saying, hey, we're here to protect your industry and get on that. And they don't have to necessarily have it on the commercial, but they definitely got to have it at rallies and they have to get it covered and the news will cover that. Be like, look, they got to make that a talking point. Oh, I'm, I'm good with a backstage handshake. You know, that's <laughs> okay. That's you don't have story. to. You you don't have to be public with it. <laughs> yeah, but the people need to know. Voter needs to know, right? So if you don't let the voter know that this candidate is adamant about reversing this process, that's right. Get in. That vote goes to because you, you do. What do you really care about? You really well, and honestly, really I think honestly, I think that's the next evolution in the politics of cigars is that we do have to be more overt and we do have to be more consistent and public in our, uh, how shall I put this, acknowledging our friends. Right. And, and we recognize our friends that have been supportive of us through, for example, highlighting the sponsors of our legislation. And I, I, I consistently put up, Look at this list of 83, 84 members of the House of Representatives, and if your member of Congress is not on it, call them and ask them why. Call them and tell them you're going to remember that on Election Day. Call them and tell them you expect them to support our legislation. And invite them to your cigar club. Invite them to your cigar shop. Every shop in America, there's no excuse for this if it doesn't happen, every shop in America should be inviting their member of Congress to visit. Yes. to get to know the issues, to see a briefing from a small business owner in, you know, on Main Street America and let them see the demographic that's in the shops. Let them see the products that are in the shop. Let them see the diversity of what's in a cigar shop and the conversation, just even just to sit down and hear the conversation, whether it be left or right, when it goes into a cigar shop, it's not like being on Facebook when you're hiding behind a keyboard. You're actually in a shop. The conversations that we have tend to be extremely civil. We start oh. to understand different points of view. And oh, I, I've got to tell you different the story. Backgrounds. I've got to tell you the story. Um, when we were first getting started on, on all of this with exemption legislation, um, 
our Democratic consultant said, you know, we should talk to Senator Manchin, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia's office. And so he laid some groundwork with his staff. And I live almost two hours from, from Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, he set up an appointment. And, uh, and the agreement was that the senator himself would meet me at the cigar shop in Charleston, West Virginia. And so the shop owner said, there's no way in hell that, that Joe Manchin's coming into my shop. I said, yeah, yeah, it was chief of staff promised that, that Senator Manchin would meet us here. So it was gonna be like on a, a 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon. And so, you know, you never know about a politician's schedule. So I drove over and got there real early to, you know, didn't wanna miss him in case he showed up early cause of an appointment changing. You never know what these types of things. And it got to be a quarter to five, no senator. It got to be five o'clock, no senator. It got to be five ten, no senator. And the owner said, there, "There's no way he's not showing up." I said, "Listen, I called our consultant. He called the chief of staff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to be there." Five thirty. I look out on the front front sidewalk of the cigar shop, and there's Joe Manchin talking on a cell phone. I said, "Look, he's he showed up." The moral of the story comes back to what you just said. Senator Manchin came into the cigar shop. Everybody stuck around for him. He sat, sat down in a chair, went to the humidor, bought some cigars, sat down and started talk, talking to people. Said, Joe, I talking to another guy named Joe. I know your mother. And uh, you remember that housing project we worked on over in Morgantown? And do you remember that, that day that we talked to you about your uncle? And he sat down and knew, I think, every of uh, somebody and every member's family. <laughs> That, that was in the cigar shop, sat down in a big leather chair, holding a cigar, pulled out our legislation, got on the phone to his chief and said, I, I, I don't have any problem with this. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. And it's a metaphor for what should be happening across the country. Right. There's no excuse for, I've taken my form, well, several members of our Congress in our region into our local shop. I know of stories across the country, especially in Pennsylvania, and I've heard it literally across the country, where shop owners have taken the trouble to invite a member in. They have a little briefing sheet on the issue, and the, you know, it's it's tough, especially for members of the House, to not pay attention to that type of an overture from a local Absolutely. small business. Absolutely, it's their constituent, and it, it ought to be happening every month in America. Oh, we got to make that happen. So. I've got, I got two more questions and, and I got the, the door open that, the, you know, I got to go take care of my dog. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a little bit of a problem right now. So I got to get him outside to do Well, it. I appreciate you scheduling this in light of that. <clears throat> when we talked this afternoon, I was, but anyway, I hope yeah. everything's all right. Yeah, he'll be fine. It's just, you know, it's going to be a rough, rough few weeks for sure. But so two, two simple questions. Well, one simple, maybe the other one, not so simple. Um, so November 4th, what does uh, Gun Loop do after this November 4th? I don't know. <laughs> Just going to kick back and enjoy no, life no, no, there, no, 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 no. There's no kicking back. I'm too young not to, to kick back. Uh, I, I haven't, I don't know right now. That's just a simple answer. Okay. I will, consider, I will consider myself a cigar advocate for, in one form or another for the rest of my days. Uh, everything I've ever lobbied for or advocated for in my life, is a permanent part of my life because it's a part of personal political conviction. I think it's a part of being an American. You stand up for what you believe in. And I, I consider cigar advocacy a part of my very being. So I agree. I, I will be hand, I will be hounding politicians till I part this earth in one form or another. All but, right, for, exactly. but formally in terms of making a living, I don't know yet. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, se second question, maybe uh, you may may not want to answer this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, this is my last question. Uh, does the CRA and the PCA merge? I don't know the answer to that either. I, I oh. literally, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. You think um, a good thing? I, if they did? I think the industry is at a crossroads. And it knows, and the good thing about it is that it knows that it has to be sophisticated, it has to be well-funded, it has to be consistent. And in that respect, cigar advocacy is at a, a great level right now. The political infrastructure is there for this industry well into the future. And that's the good thing. 
we now have a standing cadre of Congress that we know we can depend on to be our voices with whomever is in the White House. And that's a great, great thing these days. I mean, we release letters from, from uh, members of the House from Florida and Pennsylvania in the last several weeks. Everyone that signed those letters, and it was a total of 21 members of Congress from Pennsylvania and Florida, that signed a jo not a joint letter, but individual letters from their states to, the, to President Trump personally. And we know for a fact those letters were hand delivered to the Chief of Staff in the White House. You know, that's the virtue of having, having a political record. That's the virtue of having legislation that people have signed on to and gone on record for supporting this industry. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and every one of those members that signed from Florida and Pennsylvania have direct channels in one form or, or another to this administration. That would not have happened without diligently working the halls of Congress for the last decade, you know, for this industry, with this industry, where manufacturers, manufacturers have, have consistently come to Washington, D.C. to make their case. That type of response, those two letters are so symbolic of 21 members that have direct communication lines to President Trump, signed and said, we need regulatory relief and we need it now for Pennsylvania and Florida. And over the last you know, eight years, we've had over 100 letters signed by over 150 members of the House and Senate uh, do the exact same thing, stretching back to the Obama administration. Well, you've got to be consistent about it. And it doesn't mean you always get a win, but it means we're telling our story. Right. And I think that has proven some tangible political results over the last you know, six to eight years in delays, in reform and positioning this industry for the future. And we're just in the newest cycle of all of that. So I, I think that, again, you can't dismiss the political infrastructure that's been built to support this industry. And it's gonna be channeled through CRA, PCA, a hybrid. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know this industry is committed to politically protecting itself. Good. And that's the good thing. That's the, that's the great takeaway from all of this. So Glenn, um, on behalf of all my viewers and probably the whole cigar industry, I, I wanna thank you for the 12 years of dedication you've given to this industry for the fight you've been putting forth all these years, the work that's been done, just what you just said, helping to build this political infrastructure. It, thank you very much. Thank you for being well, on. Thank you. Let's do it again before election day or something, or maybe a pre-election show. There we go. We, and I'll make well, sure I bring the, yeah, so you got to remember the anniversary. <laughs> I have to get the video. I have to find the video of you throwing the regular notebook. That's right. <laughs> I, I remember my favorite part of that. Uh, I said the letter from the mayor of Miami unanswered and threw it out. The letter from the mayor of Tampa and unanswered, throw it out. I, I had that flashback when I saw that picture today. That's beautiful. Well, I'm glad I could give you some fond memories of your past. Um, Thank you everybody for watching. Uh, there will be some uh, raffle stuff on this next week. I got some things I'm gonna dig out of my human for people just for the heck of it. Uh, maybe I'll talk to Glenn, maybe there's a CRA membership somebody could win, we'll, we'll figure it out. Go to cigarrights.org, sign up. Sign up, and that's right, that was the last thing. What can they do? Cigarrights.org, sign up for CRA. Um, every little bit helps, okay? That's right. Um, if you're in for renewal, get out there and renew your CRA membership and, 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 and keep the message going. Can I say one quick thing? Yep. This, this litigation has cost over $6 million. $6 million between And that's just, that's just what you're doing. Not no, that's, that's between PCA and CRA <laughs> splitting the bill. That's not to mention how much money these brand owners are paying in legal fees to follow all this paperwork. Oh, and it's been a handful of manufacturers and, and you know, this is an industry responsibility, but I want to highlight that because, you know, that's not a lot of money in Washington. It's a lot of money to the, uh, to the cigar industry. Absolutely. And uh, every little bit counts and these manufacturers, many of them have built, really been stepping up in a way that they never could have planned otherwise. So we hope folks will help support the cause and, uh, 
at $25 for a membership with two great cigars for that with, were a real deal and the tangible benefits are, are there. We'll keep people informed through our newsletters and, and the like. So uh, we're all in this together. All right. Thank you. Thank you everybody for watching. I got to go care for my pup now. So thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Glenn.